type them in the comments and Misha behind the camera can read them to me. Um, this is Jake, he's gonna be our gaffer today. We're gonna make a piece out of cane today. So he's gonna do a little bit of prep work. But while he's doing that, I just sort of wanna familiarize anybody with the space who hasn't seen one of our demonstrations before. So this is our furnace. This holds about five to 700 pounds of glass. Um, it sits at 2100 degrees, so it's got that nice bright glow. Um, if you were here in person with us, you'd be able to really feel that warmth once I start to open that door up. So inside here, there's a large ceramic crucible, which is basically just a big bowl. And we throw a glass in cold in the room temperature state that you're familiar with it. We heat it all the way up, and then it's in this molten state that we'll get to see once Jake starts gathering. Hot glass only sticks to hot things. So this is our pipe warmer. Jake's doing a little preheating in our reheating chamber, but this is our stainless steel blow pipe. This is what Jake's gonna build his object on. You can see it has this nice little tip and then it's hollow all the way through. So when Jake blows through the end, he'll be able to inflate his bubble up. And then the other type of pipe we have is our stainless steel punchy. This one has a little counterweight on it just so that it'll help Jake turn a little bit. And then Jake's in our reheating chamber. So when we pull glass out of the furnace, you'll notice it'll start to set up pretty quickly. So we gotta heat it all the way back up to that 2150. So that chamber is about the same temperature as the furnace. Usually it's a little bit colder, just a radiating heat. You want my other glove? <laughs> it's okay. There's a reason that thing's made out of steel. So Jake's going to preheat that. We're making something out of cane today. So these are the canes Jake's pulled. Um, they're left over from our Wayne Tebow collection that we have across the street. I think they're still selling that if there's any left. So if anybody's interested in that, that's what these are from. They're a nice twisty cane. And cane, when you pull it, originally it's gonna be one strand. So hot glass is really, really elastic. So Jake can take a little bit of glass out of the furnace and we can pull it indefinitely. So we pull it into these nice strands. I got one more for you. This is a white complex cane. So you can see it's made out of tons of tiny little canes. They have more and more complicated and Italian names, but these are the canes we're working with today. So Jake has cut canes with about three different colors in them. Um, these canes were made actually using frizz, which is traditionally you'd want to use color bar, but we made these without the intention of blowing them up. So when we get our glass in its raw color form, the color that we have on the outside of these is called frit. It's this little nice little sandy texture. Um, if you guys have ever taken a workshop with us, this is the type of color we would use just because we don't really have to do any preheating. As soon as it's hot, we can stick it right on the bubble and it'll stick no problem. Whereas we have a color bar, this is not important to what Jake's doing, but this is the other form that it comes in. We have to preheat this ahead of time. Just because when glass is so thick, we can't take it from really cold to really hot really quickly. So Jake has some fun today with these canes just because they are so thick. So we wanted to give that plate a really good preheat. And that steel plate's gonna hold a lot of heat for him. And we're gonna let that heat really soak into these canes a little bit. So how this plate works is it's a large steel plate, but then it has these nice little grooves in it. So these canes are round, right? They're, whenever we have them just on a kiln shelf or any sort of flat thing, they're gonna wiggle around a lot. And Jake wants to leave a little bit of space in between them. So it has these teeny tiny ridges, almost like kind of the world's tiniest bookends to keep the canes where we want them. And since these canes are th so thick, um, they're gonna take a little bit of extra heating. They might chip a little bit, but once we sort of roll these up, we're actually gonna cut up the top and the bottom end. So if any of that pops off, we don't have to worry about it. That's all waste glass. Jake has them set up in this nice order. We got like a green and yellow and a blue and orange. So you can, once we start to heat these up, you'll really be able to tell the difference in the color when it's cold versus when it's hot. Jake's got them all lined up and he has what we call a pie divider. So this takes the length of our cane divides it by pi and tells us the exact amount of material we need to roll up the canes exactly. 
So it's got those long points on the end, and then it has that tip on the other end. So Jake will hold his bubble up to the tip, and as long as it fits within the caliper, we'll be able to roll this up at the same diameter. This is where it gets tricky, because if you're too small, it's not a huge deal. You just pop a couple canes off or something. But if you're too big, it'll leave a gap, and then Jake will have to stitch up that gap, which is a little bit more work than I know Jake wants to do. You'll notice Jake is doing the, if you have to touch it, do it very quickly technique. The hardest part about working with the material is that it really is too warm for us to touch most of the time. You just saw Jake handling those canes with his bare hands, and then he put it on that steel plate, and it's already too hot for him to really hold on to. We're going to adjust those nice and evenly. The tough thing about these is that they're a little bit wide for our spacers. So Jake has to make sure that he has the exact same amount of spacers in between every set of canes. Otherwise, our gap will be a little bit bigger or smaller, which might not make a huge difference. But I know when Jake takes this out of the annealer tomorrow morning, he's going to want to make sure they're nice and even. So Jake's going to take a heat on these. Yeah. OK. They're pretty warm. You can probably take a quick heat. Um, if it falls, it falls. Don't worry too much about it. <laughs> they're, pretty, pretty, they're, they're pretty good, but... Okay. I've never dropped a cane plate before, but maybe that today's the, the day. That was a first for me. This thing is really heavy, so we have our, what? I don't know if this is a plaster alley plate or only a kiln shelf is a plaster alley plate. But this would be our plate, so this is where the canes live, and then we have this large fork. So these are both made out of steel, and I'm five foot three, and this thing is like six foot long. So it's always very challenging for me to hold on to it. But Jake's going to take his first dip. Jake's going to roll these up on a bubble. So we could do it on a collar, which if you've watched our demonstrations before, I'm sure you've seen. But Jake's going to lay a little bit of glass. He's going to actually blow up the length of this. Are you just taking like a double dip? Okay. I'm going to give these a second. Bubble in? Okay. Okay. I'll try my best. <laughs> I'm going to put my jacket on to save my arm hair. So Jake's got his starter dip. Right now, he has enough glass to maybe make like the world's smallest cup. So he's going to take what we call a double dip. And when we're working in here, we're really working in layers, right? Because when Jake sticks his pipe in there, it's sort of like we're sticking a chopstick into honey. It's in this really, really liquid state. So there's Jake's nice, fresh gather. You'll notice he has to turn pretty quickly when we come right out of the furnace. If he ever stops turning, that glass will start to fall a little bit. And if your glass ever falls or is off center, once you put your bubble in there, your bubble will be off center. And it'll set us up for disaster. So Jake's going onto our marvering table, starting at a nice low angle, giving it a good shake. He's marvering our tip. Whenever we touch our material, we want to make sure we do it from all angles. Because when we start to introduce air, the air is going to want to go where the glass is the hottest. So normally it shoots right to that tip, but Jake's done a little bit of prep work. Our marver table is large and made out of stainless steel. The word marver comes from the sort of root noun for marble. So back in Roman times when they did this, it would have been made out of marble. But marble is very expensive and very fragile, and we live in the future. So now we have stainless steel. And stainless steel is really great because of its molecular composition. It naturally has sort of a zigzag system, so it absorbs that heat really well. So Jake could even rub his hand against the marble, and it's not going to be a problem. I'll take this heat. Yeah. So I'm going to grab this guy.
This is where I get quiet, because if I drop this plate, we've lost all our cane. Oop. I hear some popping. Can you, I lost one, can you fish it out by chance? These are some thick boys. I can fish it out later, it's okay. Just don't let me forget it. We lost one cane, but that's all right. So what I'm looking for right now is for the edge of those canes to start slumping a little bit. We got one cracked, but that's sort of to be expected with this thickness of cane. I probably could have been a little gentler on it. Jake right now is taking sort of his last dip. see if I can even these out a little bit. We're a little stuck. That's okay. You can cut that off. Yeah. Okay. These are definitely too big for this plate. Jake's going on over. And as long as they're warm enough, they won't crack. The nice thing about doing this on this metal plate is that we don't really have to worry about spacing as much. Let me get this out of the way. There we go. You don't need right door, right? Nope. You want left? Now Jake's got his cane rolled up. The nice thing about doing this on a bubble is that we don't really have to make them steal at all. They can sort of just be a decorative aspect. Jake's chopping up that broken one. Uh, I'm gonna fish that thing out really quick. Well, we have a minute. But Jake's really just gotta start reheating those canes. So they were hot enough for us to stick them to the bubble, but now we wanna get them really, really hot. So that way we can sort of smooth them out and blend them in. Sort of like a candy appearance. It's almost like that's what we made them for. So Jake's going to go in and he's going to sort of push those two canes in. Whenever we do this on a regular plate, you notice we sort of have to seal it up and stitch it up. But in this case, Jake just wants to make sure the spacing is pretty even. I'm gonna quickly fish out that lost cane. You're fine, take the heat. I got time. So the other tough thing about rolling up on a bubble is Jake wants to make sure these canes are hot enough to move around, but not so hot that the bubble's ever gonna get disturbed. Here's my nice cane goop. And how the glass comes off of the pipes is that as it starts to cool down, that glass naturally contracts off. So as the pipe starts to cool down, it just sort of scales off. We don't have to treat it in any way. You'll start to hear that thing pop in a minute. That's just that glass popping off of our blowpipe or our punty rods. This is sort of just waste glass. So when we do our canes, if we do them to the exact length of the bubble, it'll leave a scar on the bottom and you'll see all those icky ends. So we make them a little bit longer, that way we have a little bit more material and we can start to really cut into it in a minute. And Jake will just cut that off. So Jake's gonna go in, he has this cool tool. 
Oh, he's gonna go in with his jacks one more time. We haven't actually talked about the jacks yet, yo. These are sort of our iconic glass blower tools. So theoretically, you can make every single object in here with our jacks. These are our diamond shears. They cut at a diamond point. So you'll notice Jake has to turn and cut. If we were to just have straight shears, they would just cut a straight line. But in this case, we have that nice little point. So now we can start to get really juicy. So you can see that little bit of clear. We're going to wait a second. Just to let it cool, and then I'm going to blast the surface. OK, that sounds good. We're going to let it cool down a little bit. If Jake goes back in there, um, we really want to heat the outside of our bubble, right? Remember, we're working in layers. So the outer layer, if we let this cool down a lot, the outer layer is the only thing that's going to get warm. And then Jake can start to smooth those canes in a little bit. Are you gathering on top of this? Yeah. Yeah? Maybe a thin layer. Um, so our tool, I'll keep talking about our tools. Most of our tools are made out of stainless steel. We do have some that are made out of wood that we'll see later on once Jake has all of his glass gathered up. And that stainless steel is what really absorbs the heat. So when we're working in here, heat's really the name of the game. In this case, we're working in a demonstration purpose. We want you guys to see everything. But if Jake and I were working in a production studio, you would want to work as quickly as possible because the hottest the glass ever is is when it's fresh out of the furnace. So you can really use that furnace heat to your advantage. So there's some objects like ornaments that you really can just make fresh from furnace heat. Sometimes small cups if you're really good. But in this case, we're taking it slow. So once Jake has that nice and heated up, I think we're getting pretty close. A good way for us to tell how the glass is moving is you'll notice those colors sort of glow a bright color. But it can get really confusing because Jake has a mix between blue and orange. And blue is a really soft color and orange is a really stiff color. So how we actually get the color in the glass is we're adding different metal oxides. So blue is really easy. We can add copper or cobalt. Orange gets really complicated. But since I think that's an opaque orange, we have to actually add titanium into it to make it so you can't see through it which makes things very complicated. So the orange takes a lot of heat to heat up. The blue takes not a lot of heat to heat up. Makes it fun. So we have that, but we also have the movement. So you'll notice Jake doesn't wear any gloves. I don't wear any gloves unless I absolutely have to. And that's so we can really feel how the glass is moving through the pipe. Jake's giving it a little bit of air. And now we can sort of see those canes really smoothed in. You'd One more time? OK. Oh, yeah, that looks nice. Jake's going to take a dip on top of this. So we're doing this so that we can really smooth everything out. If we go in right now, you guys might not be able to tell on camera, but we have these little indents in between the canes. If we gather on top of that, Jake's totally going to trap bubbles, which we can use to our advantage sometimes. You'll see the paperweights. They'll have those big bubbles in them. You just leave a big indent in a big solid piece of glass, take a gather on top, and it'll start to form those bubbles. But with cane work, usually you don't want the bubbles. The bubbles are frowned upon. You can start to see that really nice twisty cane. You see Jake's not feeling the radiating heat. That's another good indicator of what we're working with. Door. It's a lot of work on your body. But you got to make it as easy as possible. This is sort of the boring part, as I like to say. The glass blowing is cool. And normally when we do stuff in here, you know, we can just pick up some color bar and go. But most of glass blowing is really prep work. So we took the time to make all of these chains. Jake had to cut them up and pick them out, lay them out so we could roll them up. Once you start to get more and more complicated, you're really spending all of the time making the cane and really maybe an hour making the object. 
the key to success in here is really preparation. So if Jake were to make a new piece for the first time, he'd probably make it four or five times before it's actually the way that he wants it. So when you start blowing glass, you know, you make 10,000 cups and then you finally make one good one and then you make 10,000 more cups and you look at your good cup and you're like, oh no, it's trash. Please, mom, do not display my old artwork in our house. And then you have to look at it for the rest of your life. There we go, that's pretty smooth. Jake's gonna melt out any sort of texture. When we take the glass from really, really hot and we roll it across the marver, sometimes we can get something called heat chill. That just happens when you take a really, really hot material and place it on a cold material. It turns these like wavy lines that are sort of ugly. Jake doesn't want any of that. Once our heat chills out, we are gonna have to let this set up a little bit. When we're working with colored glass, if we ever get any left in the furnace, it's actually gonna tint the entire furnace that color. So if Jake lost a little bit of blue in there, we'd all be working with blue glass for somewhere between like probably about a year before the tint comes out and you don't notice it. So since we are a public access studio, all of our glass is colorless. Um, you will find studios, they'll have something called color pop. So they'll actually be able to mix their own colors and throw them in the color pot um, just by adding those different metals. So the simplest one is copper blue. You take your clear glass, you add a little bit of copper to it, you throw it in there. It turns the entire pot this bright, brilliant blue. Which is beautiful, but not great if you're working on different types of things. So one of the biggest advantages of glass is really it's a clear material. And there are things like resin or other different types of castable epoxy, but they never really are quite as clear as glass. And the glass that we're melting is really nice because it is truly very clear. Some glasses you'll see, um, usually like the glass that your windows are made out of or your car windshield, it'll have this light green tint. That sort of comes from the iron in the ground. So when we're melting glass, our glass is made out of three main components. We're melting soda lime glass. So the main base of that is our silica. And if any of your glass is ever green, it's because there's iron in that mine silica. And silica mines are pretty common. The biggest one in North America is actually in North Carolina. There's a really great glass community surrounding that. Jake's gonna take our last dip. I'm guessing just a strip. He's got a lot of glass. So Jake's plunging in a little bit to try to avoid the bubbles, and then he's gonna give it a turn. He's gonna come straight up and down into our bucket. And it's strip gathered, gravity physically pulls all of that glass off. So it can be really hard for us to sort of determine how much glass we're gathering out. So if we ever have too much, we can pull some of it off with gravity. Jake might need a bigger block. Okay, no problem. Jake's got a nice amount of glass. I know he's gonna keep it thick, so we don't super have to worry about our canes blowing out. But with this amount of glass, if we were to get really, really thin, we could actually get pretty large. Jake's going on with our newspaper tool. This is made out of somewhere between eight to 10 sheets of newspaper, just folded up. And one of the most challenging aspects of the material is that we can never truly touch it. So you know, when a potter throws a pot, they feel the sides of the profile of the object. But in here, we can never do that. So this is as close as it gets. I like a really thick paper, just to make sure I don't ever feel any heat, and it'll take a little bit of heat out of the glass. Some people like a really, really thin paper, that way they can really get a feel for the material. But we're melting soda lime glass. So silica is the basis for all glass. That's what that iron is in. And we can put different things to counteract that green tint. So sometimes you'll throw magnesium in there and that'll counteract it in. But if you throw too much magnesium in, it turns the whole pot purple and then everybody's working with purple glass and it's a disaster. So we buy our glass pre-mixed. Um, the other aspects are the soda. So the soda works as a flux if anybody's ever worked with metal. This allows us to melt something at a much lower temperature. 
So if we were to just try to melt raw silica, we're gonna have to go up to like 4,000 degrees. Let me tell you, 2100 is enough. We don't need to go any hotter. It's nice in the winter time, but now we're getting to sort of the spring and it's starting to warm up a little bit in here. Everybody's getting a little sweaty. Then the other, com the other component of soda lime glass is the limestone. So Ohio is really great for glass because we have a really rich history of limestone, just because the ground around us used to be an ocean. What the limestone does, it makes it so the glass isn't water soluble. So if we were to take any of the pieces in our ancient collection, none of them have lime in them. We stick them in a bucket of water and eventually that glass is gonna start to break down back into the silica that it once was. And when we make something, we wanna make sure it lasts a nice long time. Especially when we're making things like cups and bowls and functional wear. We really wanna make sure that we're able to use this over and over again. So now what Jake's doing is he's bottom weighting our piece. The nice thing about these canes is that they've got that space in between them so you can see that thickness. That's sort of the optical quality of glass. It reflects the light really nice. But Jake wants this to be bottom weighted so that way when somebody uses this object later on in their lives, if something's ever top heavy, you'll like bump into it or like a cat will run into it and it'll topple over really easily. So when you first start blowing glass, you know, you make really thin bottom cups and then they all turn into flower pots. But you start to learn to understand where we need the thickness. Now Jake's gonna give that more, some more heat and he's gonna use his jacks to put in a jack line. He might have to blow it up a little bit. I'm wrong, we're going for the jack line. So this is sort of the main principle of glass blowing, right? Nothing in the museum has a pipe stuck to the end of it. So in order for us to get this off the pipe later on, it has to have this constriction line. Oh, is Jake making a bottle? No. I can never see. So we're just gonna sort of slowly squeeze. Jake's cutting off any icky stuff from the top of the cane. Oh, uh, it's that one that cracked. <laughs> That's why his jack line's a little bit longer. That's okay. We're gonna break this off from there in a little bit, so it won't really matter. But you'll notice Jake is turning the entire time. And Jake's not squeezing with his jack super hard. If he goes in there and he really cranks down on it, it's actually gonna make the jack line flat in one spot. So Jake's being pretty gentle right now, and really his left hand is doing most of the work. So you see glass blowers and you're like, oh, the right hand, that's the buff hand. It's doing all of the tooling, all of the work. But really you look at them and you'll look at their left forearms and they'll actually be much larger just from all the turning. Now Jake's got that constriction line in and we can start to blow this up a little bit. When I talk about the bubble, I'll sort of talk about it like a body. So that part that's closest to the pipe, that's called our moil. Um, we also talk about the front of the pipe, like the head of the pipe. So that's sort of our top. And then our neckline or our jackline is sort of our neck. So do you want a door? It never really feels that good. So right now Jake's going to start working on our shoulder a little bit, give it a little bit of a puff. Um, you'll notice Jake has this lovely noodle attached to the end of his pipe. Um, this is one of our blow hoses. This is sort of one of our COVID-19 adaptations. Um, you had these before, but you could use them to make like ornaments or anything you needed to make by yourself. They get tangled a lot though. Which is the hard part. So it's basically just a piece of surgical tubing. Jake has this really cool glass mouthpiece that he can really easily interchange if it ever breaks. What do we do with Jake? You want another door? Uh, yes, please. Could you actually grab another counterweight? We're just going to put a cookie for Okay. You want it dropped or? Uh, you can just cut it off on the bottom. Okay. Boop, boop, boop. I'm going to get one more pipe. If I can find one. So we're going to 
to do with this is we're going to add a foot to the bottom. So I'm not sure what shapes Jake's making. But a foot is basically, remember, it's like a body. The foot is what makes contact with the table. So it's just a little bit extra thickness. That way we don't have to worry about this ever being too top heavy. Jake's got a nice thick bowl. I'm guessing we're making a bowl based on how Jake's setting up our bubble. We want it to be sort of nice and flat. Basically making a big skittle. <laughs> Jake's going back in and cleaning up that jack line. I got your hose. The swivel always just like gets caught and then it's stuck and it's a nightmare. Is this one straight? Yep. Okay, I'm I'm gonna use this one. So I'm gonna get a little double dip of glass. I'm gonna seal Jake's diamond here. And the nice thing about glass is that hot glass sticks to hot glass really, really well. I'm gonna preheat this pipe a little bit, Jake just because it's fresh. So Jake's going to let that set up a little bit. We're going to let the glass get cold enough that it doesn't want to move, but not so cold that it's going to start to crack. And we have a couple of indicators. The color of the glass doesn't really help just because we have so much clear and the different sort of cane colors. But Jake's really looking at how the glass is moving. Damn. I'm waiting for my pipe to heat up. It's gonna make a floppy bowl. Okay, that sounds good. The cane looks better than I thought it would blow yeah, up. I think it looks nice. It's a little hazy, but yeah, but that's all right. That'll be fine. So I'm gonna get Jake and I double dip. I'm gonna let this layer cool up. This sort of acts like a core for me to have something to gather on top of. So we're gonna let this set up pretty nicely. Jake's got a pretty big bowl, so I wanna make sure he has enough material on the bottom. It's been a while since I made a cookie. Okay. What I'm looking for is see if I stop, it'll move a little bit, ever so slightly. But I'm also looking for this glow to sort of start to dissipate a little bit. And it's pretty warm. I can get pretty close to it though, before I have to start worrying. This is the waiting. Good? Okay. So I'm gonna get my last dip. Jake's gonna take one more flash. And then come over here, go straight up and down, and you'll see gravity will just pull that off nice and round. Ooh. You want those? Yeah. Jake's going to come on over. He's going to clean up my ugly cut. And then he's going to grab his diamond shears, and he's going to stick down a little bit, give it a little turn, make sure we stick this nice and on center. Give a little drag. You know, in pottery in the beginning, you sort of do that centering move. You like push down on the clay really hard. Jake sort of has to do that the entire time. I'm gonna grab a wooden paddle. Jake's gonna heat that up a little bit. It's got some pretty deep heat chill. But then he can come out and he's gonna actually use his newspaper to physically shape that hot glass up. Since we let that bowl set up and get nice and cold, we really have a lot of time to work with that fresh hot glass. Um, you'll notice Jake's really focusing on the bottom, but every once in a while he'll keep the whole piece warm. That's just called flashing. 
We never want the glass to get so cold that it's gonna start to crack and break. So we'll always give it nice little maintenance heat, make sure everything's nice and happy. You can see Jake's going in and he's physically pushing an indentation in with his thumb. If you ever like pick up a wine or a soda bottle that's made out of glass, you'll notice it has that nice big dome in the middle. You want to paddle after this one? Uh, yes, please. Um, that's so that that object makes really nice contact with the table. So it's like a ring of stability. So Jake will push in a nice little indentation. Um, I have this nice wooden paddle. We have a couple of wood tools. We have our blocks and our paddles. These are made out of root wood, so they have a really tight grain pattern. So there's a, not a lot of sap in there. If we were to use like oak or pine, it's gonna go up in flames really quickly. Nice and gentle. So Jake's coming on with his jack. I got my paddle on the bottom. And we're basically forming a mold. Do you wanna let that set up a sec? And that mold is giving it a nice crisp edge. So we're gonna let this set up a little bit. You can still see a little bit of color in that foot. Jake's gonna do a little bit of flashing, a little bit of evening out. And then we're gonna stick a punchy onto the bottom of this. So if we could just crack this off at the jack line, cut it off at the top, smooth it out, fire polish it, and boom a bowl which is how a lot of the commercially available cups are made and how a lot of the commercially available glassware is made. But when we make stuff in here, we want to have a little bit more control over the top. So I'm going to make Jacob punchy. We're basically just going to stick a nice little glob of glass on the bottom and flip this bad boy around. So I'm going to gather up a little bit of glass. And I'm basically making Jake a nice Q-tip shape. So that way we can stick it onto the bottom, but not having to worry about it fully fusing. I'm gonna wipe this marble off really quick. Give this pipe a little cool. And we cool our pipes, that way we can have a nice range of motion, sort of like a hockey stick. You don't wanna just hold the end because then it gets really hard to control. So Jake's gonna go ahead and grab his tweezers. He's gonna stick me onto the bottom. We're gonna turn a little bit. Make sure. Can I get like five seconds? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna let it set up a little bit. I always get it too hot. Okay, okay. I can take that. I just had it barely set up. <laughs> Jake's gonna use a little bit of water. We're gonna go give it a tap and it'll pop right off. I'm gonna give it a good flash just so we don't have to worry about any cracking on that rim. And I'll bring it right back to Jake. And, okay. And we have a decent amount of movement in that punny still. So what Jake's gonna do, he's gonna make any sort of minor adjustments. and start to really even everything out. Because if we stick our bunny on and it's crazy off center, when we start to open this bowl up, you'll actually be able to see it like standing at an angle. And then we gotta fix it later on. Which is far too much work. It's easier if you just take the time in here, make a couple quick adjustments, 
that it doesn't take my hours to fix later on. So now this is sort of our longest reheat. That glass was just cold enough for us to physically sort of break it like room temperature glass. And I gotta get it all the way back up to movable temp or working temperature. And you'll notice Jake and I are normally up and down, up and down, doing a lot of stuff. So to stand up there, especially with that first set of doors open, gets pretty warm. We have this nice heat shield on the side. You see that thing to the left? That blocks a lot of the heat, so normally you sort of hide your hot body behind that, but once we start getting the big doors open, that's when it can start to feel really warm. Especially now that spring is coming. Things are starting to get sweaty in here again. In the wintertime, this is really nice, because it's like, oh, nice warm place to hang out, but in the summertime, it can be brutal. Jake's going on, do you want to paddle? Sure. With this jack, I'm gonna grab our wooden paddle and use it just the same as we did on the other side. Sort of flatten that rim out a little bit. And we're gonna slowly start to open this bowl up from our skittle to a nice wide fluted shape. So now what Jake has to do, you'll notice he's really focusing that heat on the front. The tough thing about bowls is that they're such a shallow object. And if your punty ever gets too hot, then you sort of have to turn and work a lot more than you want to. So Jake's just heating the front and occasionally giving himself a flash. He's gotta be really, really careful with this turning right now, because you'll notice later on we'll start to speed up a little bit. But if Jake starts turning too fast, too quickly, it's gonna cause the entire thing to spin out into basically a big plate. Now you can really see the power sort of starting to happen with Jake's left hand. And we're sort of slowly opening the top. You ready? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and put my gloves on then. Sure. Do you want a bigger door? Uh, yeah. I'll get this. You want left or right? Oh, you can you can leave it open. Are you sure? Yep. Okay. Jake's got big doors open. This is when it gets starts to get really, really sweaty. So you'll notice Jake's gonna start really focusing on his turning. And he's gonna start to speed up a little bit. And this is using a property called centrifugal force. This is sort of how a centrifuge works, right? You sort of spin everything and it separates it. We're using that same principle in here. We got a nice big plate. Jake's gonna go straight up and down. Slow down his turning a little bit. And that gravity naturally pulls and gives it nice flutes. It's magic. Jake can go in and adjust a little bit with a wooden paddle. Cheat a little bit and deepen those flutes. This is how Maestro Dale Chihuly, of course, makes all of his floats in that type of work. Dale Maestro. That's here. And now we've got a nice fluted bowl. So what Jake's gonna do is he's gonna start flashing down if we just leave this bowl out in room temperature air, it's actually gonna cause it to cool down too quickly. So it can start to sort of crack and break pretty rapidly. So remember that punty connection is a connection that's designed to fail. So Jake's gonna use a little bit of differential heat. We're gonna heat that punty up, let the bowl cool down. And then we'll use a little bit of water and a little bit of vibration to knock it off, just like we did with our jack line. Jake's got a nice little map torch. I know we're running out of gas, but he's working with it. This is gonna allow us to just specifically heat the punchy. So if we were making something larger or more complicated, we have an array of different torches that we can use. If we try to just do all of our heating in the reheating chamber, 
that heat is too aggressive from all different directions. So it's going to heat up the wrong plates. So Jake can cheat a little bit, make everything a little bit easier, and just heat up with his map torch. One more? OK. Jake's going to do one more torch. What Jake's looking for is just a little bit of movement in that punchy. That's when we know we're ready to take it off. And so we're going to put it away on our annealer. And our annealer sits at about 900 degrees. It sits at 918, a little bit more. And we're going to slowly let this cool down over time. Jake's going to come on over to our knockoff table. I have my lovely Kevlar gloves on so I can touch any of the material. Gonna get a little bit of water with a nice butter knife. Get all the way up to where that punchy meets that bottom of the piece. You can give it a good tap. It pops right off. Then you can take our nice hot torch and physically take off any of that punchy mark. Just smooth it out nice and even. Looking for a punchy mark is a really great way to see if something's been hand blown. So you can look at the bottom. If it has that nice little dimple, that's how you know somebody made it in a hot top. Sometimes we can smooth it out a little bit, but that takes a little bit extra work. And we have our lovely brass stamp. Thank you. So I loaded it away in our annealing oven. That oven again sits at 918. We'll sort of slowly bring it down in temperature. The thickest part of that piece is where that foot is. So we don't super have to worry about annealing. Um, we have a large cast bench in our ancient gallery. And that annealed for about 11 months because it's about that thick. And it still has these teeny tiny cracks in it. So when we're cooling our glass down, we have to be really, really careful with it to make sure it's nice and stable and usable. So that's it for our demonstration. We're doing one more live stream demonstration on Friday. And then starting in April, we can go back to doing our outdoor in-person demonstrations. And I think that's every day that we're open. I could be wrong. Um, I have, all of them are at 2 o'clock. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can, of course, comment them to me. To, or if you're in the future watching this back, you can comment them in the comments, and we'll have somebody respond. Of course, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Owens, Illinois, and Well Tower, for sponsoring our demonstrations. And starting next week, we'll start to see you guys in person again. Any questions, Misha? Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on Friday. Oh, I fully cannot find it. Ooh, there it is. I got it. Sorry.